All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is Small Scenes Insights, featuring David Kingham and Jennifer Renwick of Exploring Ex Exposure and me, Sarah Marino of Nature Photo Guides. Uh, during our webinar today, it, we will take you behind the scenes to show you how we have created a few of our favorite photographs. Our agenda for today will start with presenter introductions, and then we'll go through a few of our learning goals, so the things that we hope to accomplish during our discussion today. And then after that, you'll hear presentations from David, me, and then Jennifer. And then afterward, we'll have time for a Q&A. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask us about the things that we talk about today or other topics, you're uh, going to be able to do that uh, after we do our presentations. And then we will also announce our next webinar in this series. So we also ask you that you remember that tech platforms like Zoom right now are getting overwhelmed just due to the unprecedented need for this kind of service. So if you have issues, you can try twi uh, switching to a different browser. And if that doesn't work, then just know that we will be sharing this when we wrap up. So you'll get a recording of this session. So with that, thanks again so much for joining us. We're really glad that you're here and taking your afternoon to learn a little bit about some of our favorite topics and learn about some of our photos. So thanks. So I'll start out with an introduction about me. So as I said, I am Sarah Marino and I'm a full-time nature photographer and I'm based in a little town of about 900 people in southwestern Colorado at the base of the San Juan Mountains. Uh, my business is Nature Photo Guides, which I operate in partnership with my husband, Ron Cascarosa, who is also a nature photographer. He doesn't do this full time, but we uh, both spend a lot of time together out doing photography. Uh, we offer ebooks and tutorials, including a few lo location guides, uh, resources on photographing nature's small scenes, and black and white landscape photography. Uh, we also travel part time in an Airstream trailer uh, along with our cat, Apple who very well might contribute to today's session. So if you hear some meowing, just know that she's saying hi. Um, but again, thanks so much for being with us and uh, we really appreciate it. So I'll hand it over, I think, to David for his introduction. Oh no, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, let's see, I'm unmuted, okay. Hi everyone, so I'm Jennifer. I'm the other half of David. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest, Illinois to be exact. I saw that we had one participant from Illinois. I think her name was Rebecca. I wanted to ask where she was from. Um, I'm a, from a little south of Chicago, from Naperville, Illinois. And I moved out to Colorado about five years ago now to totally switch gears. As you can see in my photos on the left there, um, I worked in veterinary medicine for 14 years before jumping into photography full time. I got started with photography about seven years ago as a hobby, kind of as an escape and relief from work, and picked up a camera and had a few life changes happen in Illinois and met David and thought, you know what, let's just give this full-time thing a whirl. Um, so I moved out to Colorado. David and I travel together full-time in a travel trailer, which you see right there in the middle of the screen. Um, so we're pretty much full-time most of the time. We do have a home base here in Denver, which we're at right now. Um, hiding from the coronavirus and just kind of sheltering in place. Um, so, but normally we would be on the road teaching workshops and that allows us to really get to know locations intimately so we can give our clients very good experiences and educational experiences because we know places like the back of our hand. Um, we also travel with two cats, which they're napping right now, but I can't guarantee they're not gonna try to say hi. Um, they've already been kind of interested in what I'm doing. Um, as far as shooting, I really enjoy shooting black and whites, um, natural abstracts. I still like grand landscapes. And the last picture on my slide here is actually courtesy of Sarah Marino from a few months ago in Death Valley. And that's usually how you'll find me in the field. I usually have my lens smashed up against something super close so I can get that macro view and photograph nature's little details. And that's me. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to David. Hey everyone, um, so I'm David Kingham. Um, Jennifer already covered a lot of um, what I'm about because we're one and the same pretty much. Um, so I'm a professional photographer and I've been doing that for I think about eight years. I'm originally from Colorado, but as Jennifer said, we now travel full-time in an RV. Although right now we are kind of hunkered down at um, Jennifer's dad's house in Denver. So we're kind of waiting out these crazy times and trying to stay safe, just like I hope you all are. 
Um, I run the site Explore and Exposure along with Jennifer, uh, where we have lots of educational materials along with workshops when, of course, we can all leave the house again. Um, I also run the Nature Photographers Network, which I would highly recommend checking out if you're looking for a great community of like-minded photographers. And so the goals for today, uh, we want to really inspire you to see opportunities for small scene photographs. And we want to inspire you to also um, try uh, telling some stories through nature. And um, you're going get, to get to see three different perspectives from each of us, because we all have kind of our own style, and also some lessons that you can learn and apply to your photography after this. So with that, I'll start this off. So I'm going to give you some insights into actually two different photographs, um, because I don't uh, have that much to say about mine. If you know me, you'd understand. I'm pretty quiet. So um, these are the two I'm going to go over. And my goal from this is really to inspire you to have an open mind to see what's around you. And this will start to make a lot more sense as I talk about it. So the first image I called Inner Light. So this was taken in the San Juan Mountains in Southern Colorado during peak fall color. Yet there's really nothing about this scene that screams fall colors. There's a little bit of color in the tundra, but that's certainly not what you think of with fall colors. The spot where we at, it's incredible grand vista. There's dramatic mountains all around you and the hillsides are covered in vibrant yellow aspen trees. So the thing about this day was it was very stormy, windy, and it was mostly kind of gray. So kind of boring um, for the Grand Vista. So it was not really that interesting, but um, rather than giving up, I really refocused my attention and I asked myself what was interesting um, about the things that were happening around me. I then noticed that there was these, um, this light peeking through the clouds which was occasionally spotlighting areas of the hillside. So I got out my telephoto lens and I started paying attention to what was happening with the light, which is something I often do and watch for. I try to make the light the subject of the image a lot of times. So I knew this image was going to be all about that beautiful light, the mountain, and really the, I mean, the mountain and the hillsides were secondary. So just some technical details about this photo. This was um, taken 160 millimeters with a telephoto lens. And I was on a tripod, ISO 160, which is the base ISO for my camera. Um, one 200th of a second, which I think I was just on aperture priority. And so I just let the shutter fall where it needed to to get the right exposure. And I was at F8. Um, everything was so far away that there wasn't a problem with depth of field. So I just set it to F8 to get the sharpest aperture. Um, this was really just one of those F8 and B there shots, um, nothing too technical about it, really simple exposure. So just to show you some alternate light that was kind of happening during this, um, this one we have kind of the, a lot of the hillside getting lit up. And then this one, the kind of the lower part was hitting it. So I was really just waiting for that perfect opportunity to just get that light and that area where I wanted it just hitting this little hill here. So this is what the raw file looked like. And you can see it's pretty dull and uninteresting. And it's something you might just pass over if you were looking at it in Lightroom later on. Um, but I knew that with some really targeted processing that I could bring out the drama in this image and make something really unique. So a little bit about the post-processing for this one. Um, I darkened this one quite significantly. And um, when you're trying to create a moody image, I always start by bringing the exposure down, but it can also be really hard to maintain detail and nice tones when you're doing this. So the way that I maintain detail is by bringing up the black slider in Lightroom. And bringing up the blacks is kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people we're taught to bring them down typically. Um, but what I do is I counteract this by bringing down the mid-tone darks and the tone curve, which achieves those really rich darks with lots of detail. So I, I go into this in depth um, in my most recent video on colors and tones, which I can send you a link to later. And I also added, added a heavy vignette to this to help keep the 
um, viewer's eye drawn in and you know keep them in the frame, keep them really interested in that light area. So I also burned and dodged some areas where I didn't want the viewer's eye to go. And I also brightened up the light areas, which is where I want people to look since it's really the subject of the photo. And I also cooled down the shadows to give an overall cold feeling to the image. And then I warmed up the light tones to give a nice contrast between the cool and the warm. So the storytelling behind this photo, um, the story that I was trying to tell is, I was thinking about without darkness, there is no light. So I was trying to tell a story by using the light and the colors, by creating an overall dark, cold, gloomy image, and then having that splash of warm, bright light kind of gives a sense of hope, a sense that this storm too shall pass and the light will shine again. So it's a reminder that we, we could all use right now. And I wanna talk a little bit about contemplative photography, which is um, really just the idea of being open to seeing what's around you. So if I had been laser focused on the grand scenic and never took my wide angle lens off, um, I would have never, I would have been really disappointed this day. Um, nothing ever materialized to make a good grand scene. So instead I was able to open my mind to seeing everything around me and just being open to things that catch your attention. So it ended up being the light this day that caught my attention and I actually ended up creating one of my favorite photos from that trip. So for the next image, I call this Rise of the Phoenix. And it's a very abstract image that was created in some unknown canyon in Moab, Utah. Uh, it's a very pretty canyon, but it's also kind of disgusting at the same time. Uh, it, it has a shallow river in it that's mostly standing water with black stinky mud and just it's generally gross to walk through. Uh, but the cool thing about this canyon is the oils that develop on top of the water. We're, excuse me, we're not exactly sure where the oils come from. Jennifer and Sarah think it's from cow poop, <laughs> but I think it's from natural petroleum coming up to the ground because it's like constantly there. But either way, it's kind of disgusting and not a place a normal person would want to spend their day but we're weird photographers, so we like this kind of stuff. Um, we had been photographing these oils for hours and we're starting to get a bit tired. So we were working our way back to the car and I was mostly finished for the day. My back hurt, I was getting kind of tired. Um, Jennifer was, was in front of me walking through the water in the oil and um, she was still shooting a little bit. And but the, the oil was breaking up when she walked in through it. So it's kind of breaking into these small fragments. And because I was still open to seeing what was around me, I happened to notice a small area where the water was causing the oil to swirl around. So I quickly set up and I started firing away with a longer shutter speed. And I didn't know what to expect, but was really pleasantly surprised seeing the first images that popped up. So I had a bunch of different alternate um, compositions that I was working with. So this is, you know, one of them kind of in between and it was constantly changing. So it was all, creating all these unique um, images and it was really kind of just luck, but I was paying attention to what different things were happening. So I was constantly changing my composition and trying to find different things or just waiting for the water to swirl in a certain way. And <clears throat> eventually I ended up with this, which, um, I thought it looked like kind of an eyeball. So that's why, I, you know, I thought there was kind of a bird looking in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some technical things on this photo. This was taken with uh, a 200 millimeters with telephoto. And I was on a tripod shooting straight down. And I was at my base ISO of uh, ISO 160. And I stopped down my aperture to F13 in order to achieve a half second shutter speed. And this was because it was getting kind of dark. The sun started to go down. So we were in the shadow. So I didn't need an ND filter to slow this down to a half a second. I just had to stop down my aperture a bit. Um, so not too much technical about this. Um, it was really just knowing what shutter speed to use. So I knew by the 
way but like by the speed that these were moving that around a half a second work to kind of streak them but still leave some of the oils to where they weren't moving very much and hopefully you can see this video let me try to play this this is what it kind of looked like when they were spinning around it might freeze up on you a little bit hopefully you can kind of see that so some really interesting stuff happening there and so this is what the raw file looked like. So it's very dull. And when you're photographing in the shade, like we were this day, your image may not look all that interesting to start with, but um, rest assured that when you add, um, or you pull out the contrast in this, that it'll start to come to life. So don't get too disappointed when you take something in shadow. We actually take a lot of stuff in shadow these days. So the post-processing on this, um, I darkened this one slightly. Um, this one was pretty simple. I didn't do a whole lot. So I brought up the blacks again, and I brought down the mid-tone darks in the tone curve. And I also pulled up the whites, which helped bring out um, that contrast. And also removed some distracting elements. There was something up in the upper left corner that I got rid of, and just some other pieces of oil that didn't look that great. Um, and then I found the perfect white balance to really bring out those colors because if I would have gone like too warm with this, I would have lost those nice blues in there. So finding that right white balance is really important for this kind of stuff. Now, as far as the storytelling goes on this image, um, it's very abstract. So this is really up to the viewer's imagination um, for what they see in there. You know, I see that bird in the center but anyone could see whatever they want in this. So it's, it's a really cool thing about the abstract photos is you just use your imagination and you see whatever you wanna see. And then again, with the contemplative photography, um, if I didn't have my mind open to see something new, I would have never noticed this. Most of the day I was focused on finding pristine oil and really didn't pay attention to what we had walked through. Uh, but thankfully, by the end of the day, I started to open up my awareness and truly see what was around me. And this was actually my favorite image of the day. So that is the conclusion of mine. So now let me uh, switch over to Sarah. I'll shut myself off. All right, Sarah, if you want to okay. go ahead and jump in. All right. So for my photo, I chose to focus on a photo that for me is the feeling of healing through the photographic process. And I felt like that would be a good topic for today, given that we're all going through a lot of complexity and unknown and uncertainty right now with everything happening with the coronavirus. So this particular photo tells that story for me and I'll go into some of the reasons why. So a couple of years ago, we had an incredibly difficult two weeks in October. So it started with moving to a new house in a new community that was about five and a half hours from where we previously lived. So that's a pretty stressful experience. And then, Ron was laid off from his, new, or from his job. So that was a super stressful experience. And then our cat had been sick and we were driving to the vet to pick her up to bring her home. And the vet called and said, well, actually she's dying. So we arrived at the vet and went through that process of having her as she passed away. And that was incredibly traumatic. So that was a really hard period of two weeks that we went through. Um, when you look at things like lists of stressful situations, any individual one of those would be like a, in the top 10. Well, to have all three of them happen in a two-week period was a lot to deal with. So as we were driving back from the vet, we picked up our Airstream trailer, and by the next morning, we were in Zion National Park, where it was uh, autumn was just getting underway. So pulling into the campsite next to David and Jennifer felt like a tremendous bit of relief after a lot of really hard days. Uh, so seeing the fall colors, the beautiful golden colors in the trees, hearing the leaves that were on the ground crunch under my feet, it just felt like 
Finally, I can breathe after a really hard period. And then we went on our first hike, which is where I took the photo that I'm going to be talking about today. And that felt like the first time like, that I had a sense of hope and a sense of healing from what had been a really traumatic period. So I felt like that lesson was, could be really helpful for all of us who are going through a lot of uncertainty right now, a lot of loss, like all of our photographer friends are, there, have seen their businesses disappear overnight. And then on the broader scale, just all the, the tragedy surrounding this virus that so many families are experiencing, uh, the sacrifice of healthcare workers and other frontline workers. So just this, this experience that I had a couple of years ago, I feel like it's relevant to what we're all going through right now and that we really can find hope and healing in photography and the creative process. So uh, with that, I'll start talking a little bit about the photo, which was taken in Zion National Park which is in southwestern Utah. And Zion is really well known for uh, the really tall sandstone walls. So Zion Canyon, you feel enveloped with red sandstone. Uh, the Virgin River flows through that area. Um, the Narrows and the Subway are two really well-known features uh, that involve creeks and rivers. Um, there's super dramatic scenery and a lot of iconic locations. But when I'm visiting Zion, I also want to see the hidden side of the park as well. So that reflects my personal style and my vision for my photography. And the first thing is that I, I really want to be exploration oriented. So I want to always see what's around the next bend. I want to hike a trail that I haven't hiked before and maybe haven't seen anywhere but marked on a map, haven't seen any photos from that place. Um, and that's what th happened with this particular photo. We were uh, hiking on a well-known trail, but did some exploring. We found a little user trail and did some exploring beyond that main trail and found a really interesting new location. Um, I also spend a lot of time just being really slow in nature, being methodical and meditative in how I work, uh, really trying to see things that are interesting by just wandering around to see what I might find. Uh, I definitely want to show the graceful side and the elegant side of nature uh, amidst a very chaotic, like Zion National Park is a very chaotic environment. The first couple of times that I visited the park, I was very overwhelmed with the landscape. And so my repeated trips, I've been looking for ways to put order to that chaos and then show grace and elegance in the scenes that I find. And then like David mentioned, uh, I really like trying to find an opportunity in any landscape. And that will be, I hope, one of the messages that we can convey today is that even if your yard is just full of dormant plants right now, it still could be full of opportunities for photography. And then I tend towards uh, presenting my work in portfolios rather than single photos. So I'll go through a couple of themes that this photo fits in for my own work. Uh, for this particular photo, some of my storytelling goals included sharing more than peak fall color. Uh, so fall is a lot, or autumn is a lot more than just golden hillsides of perfectly turned trees. I'm really interested in uh, trees that are just starting to turn and there's some green mixed in to the very end of autumn where we start having much more bare trees and decaying leaves on the ground that the transition has like full through that full transition there are photographic opportunities um, and then for Zion as well there's tremendous ecosystem diversity just because of the, the dramatic elevation changes that you see within the park so I want my photographic work from Zion to tell that story as well. Um, and just in general, the smell of decaying leaves in autumn is the most intense feeling, like emotional reaction that I can have just based on that smell. It just brings me back to a lot of really pleasant memories. And I think that's one of the reasons that I'm really drawn to photographing leaves on the ground. Uh, I also like to spark curiosity with my photos. So in this case, I think a lot of people would look at the photo and say, that looks like it's from Vermont or somewhere in New England. Uh, but I had no idea that that mix of trees existed in Zion. So just that little spark of interest and, in, oh, I might want to get to know that ecosystem a little bit better. Uh, this is an example, this photo here, of something, that, a photo that I took in Zion. So another rendition of the same kind of organic oils that David was talking about. Um, and it's the kind of thing that just that people can look at and say, hmm, I, I have no idea what that is. I'm really curious about it. 
And then finally, I like to communicate a little bit of an element of surprise. So um, again, like, oh, that's, that was taken in Zion National Park. I had no idea that there was that mix of leaves. Uh, this is a set of my photos from Death Valley National Park. And I chose this just to give an example of what that element of surprise can look like in a different landscape. Uh, so people don't usually expect to see foggy Joshua trees or misty layers on mountains, bark, uh, changing cottonwood trees, like pink ripples, lupin flowers, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, that each of these photos, I think if you showed them to someone who wasn't super familiar with Death Valley and said, this is Death Valley National Park, they might be like, wow, I had no idea that that landscape included these kinds of things. So I'd like to do that with some of my photography. And I hope that this particular photo is like, like oh, I, I'm curious about learning more about the trees that grow in Zion or the, the ecosystem and landscape that helped create that scenario. So with that, uh, this is the photo that I'll be talking about today, and I named it Fantasy Pond because I felt like it was just so incredible to see this mix of leaves and colors it floating in a pond that was just, it was probably 12 feet across, uh, so not a big area, but it collected an incredible mix of leaves. And the curious thing is that we have been here before, and it was in previous years filled with a totally different kind of leaves. So what about this particular year? resulted that resulted in this particular beautiful mix. Not sure, but it, we were super happy to, to stumble upon it. Uh, so this photo fits into three themes that I like exploring. So first, fallen autumn leaves, like I mentioned before, that the smell and experience of decaying leaves just really is a, a key experience for me in autumn. Uh, six of these photos are from Zion, and then the rest are from other places. And then I like finding striking patterns and repetition in nature. So this photo definitely fits both of those so that there's a pretty distinct pattern and a lot of repetition throughout the frame. And then I've been working for years now on getting a better portfolio of Zion National Park. So this, this set of images here gives you a sense of what uh, some of my work has looked like in the park, both from the grandest landscapes, uh, some back backcountry work, some more familiar scenes, and then uh, hopefully a little bit of a representation of all the seasons. So now I'll go into some of the details behind creating this photo. So the technical information is I was using a Canon uh, 6D at 78 millimeters for my lens. I used F18. Uh, Focus stacking would have been better, but a slight breeze meant that it was really hard to get all the leaves in focus if through focus stacking. So I was able to do that with F18, uh, 0.4 of a second at ISO 200. And then as I'll show later, I spent a lot of time experimenting with a polarizer and different angles around the pond because it gave me a really different result. And then these kinds of photos sometimes require ridiculous tripod angles. So trying to get as far out over the pond and facing downward as much as possible without actually getting into the pond because that would have totally disturbed what we were trying to photograph. And then I spent a lot of time waiting for the clouds to shift. Um, the, my favorite was when it was bright overcast because that gave a, I think that brought out the colors nicely in the scene. So now I'll talk a little bit about the composition and light behind this photo. So to start out with the light, like I mentioned, this was bright overcast. So there was a big cliff behind us that was shading the scene. But the, in the first photo at the top, there was, the sky was bright overcast versus the bo bottom photo. The scene was still in the shade, but there was blue sky overhead. So getting a lot of really blue reflections in the water. So it just gives a totally different feel, even though it's the exact same scene. Uh, in the top one, the having even light over the scene was important so that it was that all of the colors and tones looked the same. And then the dark water. As you can see in the lower one, that those blue reflections totally change the feel. And in this case, I like the dark water because it helps the colors and the, the lighter tones and the leaves pop against that darker background. Uh, so you can get a sense of how different the lighting situation 
uh, resulted in completely different photos. So anytime you're working with water, you might want to consider experimenting with the angle that you're facing it, that you're facing your subject, and then what, seeing what a polarizer does, either to maximize reflections or minimize reflections. So I'll t now talk through four of my composition alternatives. So this first one, I feel like it's decent, but the lower left lacks the same light colored leaves. So you can see these light leaves throughout. They don't, they aren't nearly as prominent in this lower edge or this lower corner. This next one, this big light leaf, I feel like it has way too much visual weight in this scene. So yeah, I, it, I could have shifted over more to the right for sure. But this leaf is the main reason that I said, no, I'm gonna go on to a different composition. Uh, this next one, it's too expansive and I feel like the background fades too much. So you get the sense of the individual leaves here, but as you go into the background, all of the, the individual characteristics just fade away and it's kind of a mass of muddy colors. And then this final example, it's on un, really uneven light. I don't feel like it's balanced and there's no flow through the composition. So uh, you can see this dark patch up here. There's another patch. Here's a kind of bluish patch. You have reflections here, no reflections here. So that one's just a total mess. So here's the final composition. And really for this photo, the pattern is the composition. But there are a couple of things that, that help refine it more than those, those example, the previous four examples that I showed. So first of all, there's more balance in this. So you get the same mix of leaves pretty much throughout the entire frame. There's a nice diagonal flow because of those light green leaves. There are a lot of them that are facing diagonally through the frame. So that helps add a lot of structure to the composition. So even though the pattern is where I started with the composition, some of those other little details help add that structure and flow that I think help elevate it above some of the other options that I was choosing from. So whenever I'm photographing this kind of scene, I'll share five lessons that I keep in mind. So I always look for repetition throughout. So making sure that, this, that the pattern that I'm looking at repeats throughout the entire scene and is pretty consistent throughout. Um, here, the arrangement of leaves is pretty even. So there are maple leaves throughout. There are the, the thin greenish leaves and um, the thin yellow leaves. So there's a really nice arrangement throughout the scene. I was careful about my edges. So like that bright leaf before, avoiding that kind of thing. And then I was seeking to minimize distractions. So there were some logs floating in the pond and there were some big sticks sticking up out of the pond. So I wanted a composition that eliminated those distractions and instead focused on the repetition in the leaves. Uh, so when I'm photographing this kind of scene for the final lesson, I want the feeling that it extends fully beyond the edges of the frame. So in all directions, these leaves extend, even the oh, there were logs floating and other things, and that's not exactly what it was like in real life. I want that it to be what it feels like when you're looking at the scene. So for my processing, you can see the top raw file, or the top is the raw file, and the bottom is my finished version. And here in Zoom, it looks just a little more saturated than I intended it to, so you can see a final version on my website exactly as I intended. But you get the idea. You can definitely see the differences. So to start, uh, I always look for details along the edges and then clean up some little, some little imperfections like little specks in the water. Uh, you can see like this upper corner, there's a bright leaf. So I eliminated that. There's another leaf down here that I darkened and, and um, did a little green color painting. So those kinds of things on the edges. I, I always prefer color or cooler colors. So when you look at my portfolio of work, you'll often see much cooler colors. So I shifted this to a cooler color balance so that the, instead of the maple leaves looking to be an orangey red, they are more of a purpley red. I added a modest amount of contrast through things like a levels adjustment and a mid-tones luminosity mask in Photoshop. And then I saturated the reds and the greens in particular. 
darkened the water so that the leaves stand out a little bit more. So that's another example of adding some selective contrast. So using a dark luminosity mask to just bring down those darkest tones. And then that helps the leaves pop a little bit. And then I, as I mentioned before, I darkened some of the brighter leaves on the edges so that they didn't stick out as much and just generally added a little bit of a vignette. So my vision for this photo was the cooler tones, having the leaves really stand out, that this is all about the mix of colors. Um, and so the, my processing really focused on doing some contrast adjustments, some color and some color adjustments primarily. And then I always do a little bit of cleanup since I'm sometimes a little bit too obsessed about those kinds of details. So that gives you a sense of my start to finish for this. And then I'll show you one final version so you can see how all of that came together to create this photo, which again, I called Fantasy Pond from Zion National Park. So with that, we can switch to Jennifer. Okay. Give me one second here. I thought it was all queued up and it disappeared. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go into or explain my thought process behind one of my favorite photos here. So as you can see from the sentence on the bottom of the slide, the photo I'll be discussing is about experiencing and capturing the fleeting mon moments in nature, which is one of my personal favorite things to capture. Not only that, but I'm also going to relate it to experiences that were kind of going on in my life at the time that this photo was captured. So I'm just gonna set the scene for you guys real quick here. So it was February, 2018. Um, we were in the middle of our Death Valley National Park workshop series. We generally spend about two to three months there every winter teaching. Um, and we were in between workshops. So this was kind of like what we refer to as our free time. Um, I like to say that this was a spa day out on the dunes, meaning free exfoliation for those brave enough to go out there. It it was an extremely windy day in the park and the dunes were just flowing with sand. Gusts were about 40 to 50 miles an hour and we know from past experiences that this makes wonderful conditions for photographing the dunes. I know some people have some hesitations about heading out into conditions like this, but it's really a magical experience if you can get out there and enjoy these conditions. And I also say that there was a painful anniversary because I was actually coming up um, the night we went out to photograph, I was coming up on my mother's death from a year ago, um, two days before the date to be exact. So I was feeling a bit melancholy as I was approaching her one year anniversary. Um, her death had occurred while we were in Death Valley the previous year while we were teaching a workshop, unfortunately. So a lot of my trip to Death Valley um, this year, 2018, was about kind of coming to peace and getting over the aversion that that event kind of set into motion. I mean, Death Valley is one of my favorite places to be, and I didn't want that to, you know, create, you know, not good feelings since we spend so much time there, to kind of put it bluntly. Um, so on this particular evening, um, you know, I went out, spent some time in nature, I think a lot of us photographers, you know, see nature as a therapeutic medium. So I went out for therapeutic purposes, and that's what my intention was going out in this evening, just finding peace, kind of some solace, and just kind of taking my mind off things and just letting nature do the talking. So here are David and I creating a fashion statement on the dunes. Um, there should be a little catwalk for us to walk down since we look so stunning. Um, I'm an asthmatic, so going out in these dune conditions and keeping particulates out of my lungs are, is probably the main goal. Um, eye protection is a must for both of us because we both wear contacts. Um, David is sporting some sexy construction type sunglasses, and I actually got out one of my ski mask masks with a clear lens, and obviously we have the masks. So valley fever is a concern if you are heading out into dunes when they're windy. Um, Southern California has had quite a few cases of it. None have been reported in Death Valley, but safety first. Um, when you can't see the atmosphere because there's so much stuff blowing around, it's just better to be safe. 
So if you don't have masks and you are heading out into the dunes, um, we recommend a bandana just to cover your face and your, or your, excuse me, your nose and your mouth, just to play it safe. But, and it's always fun to, you know, walk around the dunes like this. You know, it's stylish. So Death Valley. I like to say many valleys, many opportunities. Death Valley is one of my favorite locations for small scenes. It's literally a small scene, natural abstract, even a grand landscape paradise. Um, you have such a diverse range of subject, subjects to shoot anything from sand dunes, salt pans, mountains, playas, mud cracks, slot canyons, badlands, craters, and even riparian areas for a surprise, and plants. So it's always one of our favorite places to go ahead and do these smaller scenes because there's just so much to shoot. And the landscape is very dynamic. Chances are if you see some wonderful mud cracks one year, they'll be completely gone when you're back out there the following year because the landscape is pretty much based on deposition and erosion and it goes away very quickly. So it's always exciting to visit places that we enjoy in Death Valley and then seeing that there's something completely new there the following year. And it makes it hard for people to copy you, so that's a bonus. So a little bit about my personal photographic vision and style before I dive into my photo. So if you've followed me for a while, you know that I'm a supporter and follower of slow photography. So slow photography refers to taking a slow, more deliberate approach to your photography and really connecting with the landscape that you're in. Overall, it creates more meaningful photos and that's very important to me. I also enjoy storytelling. Every grand landscape has a story to tell, and within that grand landscape, there are a bunch of different smaller stories to be seen. I also like to use metaphors and analogies with the landscapes and the subjects that I shoot to express my own thoughts and feelings. I also like to showcase the smaller, often not appreciated details in nature. If you've followed me for a while, you know I'm obsessed with mud. I'm proud of that, no shame. Um, so I like to photograph these smaller details and I have an innate curiosity for those details around me. I like to think it probably comes from my history in veterinary medicine because I was actually working on getting my board certification as a CBT in clinical pathology. So I spent a lot of time over a microscope looking at blood smears, cytologies, urinalysis, um, you name it. And really looking at those smaller details I think translates into my photography nowadays because I just, I see them everywhere. Um, funny story, when David and I usually go out photographing, he'll walk right by something that I just hone on in, and at the end of the day when we're showing each other our photos, he'll say, where was that? And I'll say, oh, you walked right over it, you know, right at the beginning of the hike. So it's always fascinating to see how I just, I do see those smaller details more often than not. Um, another thing that I do is I go into the landscape without any expectations. This opens my mind to what's around me. We've heard Sarah and David both talk about this today. And I prefer to think of it as a hike in nature with my camera and photographing what appears to me versus just making photography the priority and exploring and hiking second. I do sometimes go out with the sole intention of photographing and planning shots, um, but not having expectations makes up about 80% of my own photography. And the last thing I like to do is utilize photo projects and galleries to collectively tell a story with my images versus just bringing home some greatest hits. Um, giving the viewer a complete picture of the landscape is something that I strive for with my imagery and it also helps with my own creative process. So photo projects are wonderful to utilize. Um, yeah, I love them. And if you follow me, you know I like to put things into projects. So some ideas I wanted to express with this photo, not this one particularly, but we'll see it soon on the next slide. Um, but these are some of the words that kind of came into my mind as I was photographing that image. So renewal. Sand dunes are a great example of renewal. The patterns shift and change with each windstorm and they clean them of footprints, humans and animals alike. And sometimes we too need a clean slate in our own lives. Change. This coincides with renewal a little bit. The dunes are continually changing, just like our lives. Nothing in life is certain. So the death of my mother brought a new change that I was still getting used to in navigating. And finally, drama. Dunes can be very sensual and sexy, but they can also be very dramatic with their tones and contrasts and even viewing them in different types of light. So I found that my journey of grieving my mother was also very dramatic, filled with the highs and lows that the grieving process can bring. So here is the image I'll be discussing. 
It's a dramatic, smaller scene from that evening on the dunes, and it ties together a lot of what I just described. Um, I named it Lines in the Sand, particularly just because of the illuminated ridges. I was also trying to play on the words a little bit of draw your line in the sand, but I didn't take it too literally, and that's the name I came up with. So some technical details about the photo. I photographed this with my Nikon D750. Um, I used my 28 to 300 millimeter lens. I used it at the 300 millimeter length. My ISO was 100. I used the aperture 8.0 and it was about one two hundredth of a second. Um, I did not use a polarizer and wind was definitely a challenge out here with those 50 mile per hour gusts. So I definitely used my tripod. And I know it's not a technical thing, but I also brought my patience because photographing these dunes in the wind, you do need a lot of patience. Um, I also used continuous shooting to catch the various stages of the sand blowing off the ridges. So when I got home that night, I at least had, you know, a vast variety of when the wind was blowing and the different patterns because every breeze kind of moves the sand just a little differently. So I wanted to make sure when I got home, I had a bunch of different shots that I could choose from. So I, you could say I kind of sprayed and, sprayed and prayed on the dunes. I know most people do that for wildlife, but hey, it works on sand dunes too. So one of the first things in my composition here um, that caught my eye when I stumbled upon this little scene was symmetry. So having symmetry in landscape photos can be very pleasing and calming to the viewer's eyes. As humans, we're drawn to these compositions that exhibit this harmony. So you can see here with my two orange circles, these were the two areas of symmetry that I saw. They're almost like mirrored images of each other and I thought that was pretty unique because you know every dune is different but these two were very similar. So that's the first thing that caught my eye. Secondly, the lines alone. Like I said, the lines illuminated with the sun, the ridges, um, the glow of these lines is what initially led my eye into the scene. And it's very pleasing to our eyes to have lines coming out from the left side of our film to the right side. Because just like in our English language, we read left to right. Now that's not saying that if you have lines coming in from the right or above or below that that's wrong. That's not it at all. It's just if you have the opportunity to place lines kind of coming out from the left hand side, our eyes just like that a little bit better and it's a little more pleasing. So compositional elements. I like to break my compositions down into these elements and shapes so I can organize the scene more quickly when I'm out in the field, especially if it's very chaotic. It seems elementary and people will ask me if I still do this nowadays and my answer is absolutely yes. Um, I do it all the time, especially like I said, those vast vista scenes or trees or a lot of rocks. I really break it down into the elementary form and it really helps my brain kind of figure out where I want to focus on or place pleasing or place elements to create more pleasing photos. So here we had some nice triangular shapes. We had four of them and I liked the way they were all kind of interacting with each other. And then the next thing that I saw was this nice zigzag. So you can see it takes your eye from the left hand side of the frame kind of through the middle to that nice little highlighted ridge back to the left and then finally out to the right. So it keeps your eye continually moving around the frame, which is one thing that we as photographers always want to make sure a viewer's eye is doing. We never want to intentionally, unintentionally, excuse me, lead them out of the frame. We always want to keep them moving in the frame because they're staying focused on our film and they're looking at it longer. So I use my telephoto to isolate this, obviously. I didn't want to include distracting elements such as the sky or the background dunes. There were also some mountains in the background. Um, so that really um, formed my composition as well. I knew what I wanted to zero in on. So what was the light doing in this situation? So it was around sunset. Um, if you ever have the chance to photograph dunes at sunset, it's, it gets really pretty and glowy right before the sun sets below the horizon or the mountains. So this was about the last five minutes of light that I was capturing before the sun completely set. It was very hazy and atmospheric, lots of dust in the air, lots of sand. Um, although very pretty, I wanted to keep it out of my film um, because I was focusing more on a smaller scene. Um, the light made for these beautiful backlit ridges and the backlit blowing sand, my little wispies as I call them, were nicely lit up here in the front and the back. And the contrast was something else that I really enjoyed. I liked the areas of highlights and I liked the areas of darkness. 
it was a nice marriage between the two in one frame. So there were a few other compositions that I kind of played with. Um, when I first saw this scene, I, I admittedly I went right into it, but I always like to give myself options and you know some things work better than others. And I don't like to fall into that tripod hole syndrome, which I see a lot of people do where they plant it and they stay there for the next hour. Always keep moving, and especially in the dunes. They're very dynamic. They're not static, especially in the wind. Um, so keep moving around and you'll see all these little compositions just all of a sudden appearing. But on this one, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do. So the composition on the right, um, these are the raw images. Um, there's a lot of sky and the sky holds a lot of visual weight. So even though the lines are pretty and I can see some wispies, my eye goes right to that white area. So that's what we say holds a lot of visual weight. So our viewer's eye will be drawn to that more so than the meat of our picture. And I also didn't really care for the dune kind of the outline in the background. Um, and so I moved to the right a little bit and got a little closer. Or excuse me, oop, I'm getting ahead of myself. There we go. Um, actually moved to the left because I wanted to get rid of the sky. And as you can see here, I got rid of the sky, but I gave myself the addition of this one random kind of dune ridge line here. And there's also some vegetation right here in the corner that's kind of the splotchy stuff on the lower right hand corner. And so I got rid of one, but I gave myself two other compositional problems. So I decided that wasn't going to work. So then I finally decided on this composition. So I say no sky, there is a little bit of sky in the corner, but for the most part, the big triangle chunk of sky is gone. Um, there were no other dunes below and there was no distracting vegetation. So I accomplished this by just moving a few feet to the left and using my telephoto to zoom in. And this is the raw file. So a little bit about my processing. So I cropped a little bit off the left, the top and the right. So I know some people are super hesitant to crop their images. I am not one of those people. Um, sometimes the 300 just wasn't enough this evening um, to really just get rid of the sky completely. So I'm not blowing this up to hang on a, on a billboard. I've never really been a big pixel obsessive person, so I'm totally fine cropping my images. So I did crop to get the sky out and a little off each side. Um, and before I go into this, I generally like to do most of my processing in Lightroom. Um, I do take things into Photoshop for some very specified things, but for the most part, I enjoy using Lightroom. I'm usually in there about 10, 15 minutes. I do my few Photoshop things and then I'm done. Um, so in Lightroom, I pulled up my whites to add a little contrast and pulled down my blacks. I did add a little bit of warmth and I did slide my tint slider towards the magenta side a little bit because I've been shooting with Nikon my whole career. And sometimes depending on the camera model, you can get a little bit of a green tint and I've noticed it on sand dunes and on cloudy days. Um, it was worse on my 750. I also shoot with a D500 and I've never seen that. So I don't know what it was. Maybe it was just that camera. I'm not sure, but there was a little bit of a green tint. So I did slide my slider towards the magenta a bit to counteract that. And I generally use just a little bit of magenta in all my landscape images because they tend to look nicer that way. And it's all personal preference when you get to processing. So whatever you feel you like, then do that. Um, I pulled up my vibrance a little bit just to create some more color for those softer colors. And I did add a touch of clarity. Now, generally, I stay away from the clarity slider because it's very aggressive. It can, you can go downhill fast with your image if you use it too much. It looks good from far away, but when you get up close, you see all that noise. But I did use it here because it is helpful in some situations where you have some haze or some fog. Um, so I did it to bring out the little wispy little wispy strands on the sand dunes to bring more attention to them. And then I moved the photo into Photoshop. And what I did there, if you can see on the raw image on the left, there's still some distracting little black marks in the dunes. Um, I had a few dust spots, so I took care of that. And finally, I added just a little bit of Orton to my lights. I did not add it to the entire image. I added it only to, I think this was lights two or lights three, if you use the TK panel, um, just so I didn't apply it everywhere because sometimes it can look a little weird. Um, but I did want to draw attention to the nice flowy areas, so I added it to there. And there's the final image. So pretty simple. Um, it was a wonderful night to be out. It's a very memorable night for me just because of the situation I was in. 
Um, sand dunes are always amazing to shoot and this was no exception. Um, so yeah, so that's my thought process about this smaller scene and everything that went into it. And hopefully that kind of helped you guys understand the image a little more. And now I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. Well, thanks so much for joining our webinar today, everybody. Uh, we hope that you took away some ideas that you can apply in your own photography. And we would like to share one quick idea. Um, just since we're all stuck inside or in our yards or in local parks, we would encourage you to look for opportunities in your immediate environment. So even though you might not typically photograph some of those subjects, there is still a lot to do. And uh, I encouraged one of a, pre a previous workshop client to try this out. And one of the things he said to me is it really helped lift his gloominess just to get out and try nature photography, even just in his own backyard. So I would encourage some of you to try this as well, just by looking for opportunities in your immediate environment. And that could be things like uh, if spring hasn't emerged in your area, sorry, my webcam just went out. I'll put the, that back on. Um, so if spring has not emerged in your area yet, think about dormant plants and bare trees. So I spent a lot of time uh, this winter photographing dormant plants just to stretch my abilities and found all sorts of opportunities. Um, if spring is emerging in your area, start looking for some of those new green leaves and new growth. And then if you can't safely access any outside places, you could consider ordering some flowers just to have them delivered to your house or pick them up next time you're at the grocery store. You could have succulents delivered, which are a beautiful plant for indoor photography. So that there are a lot of things that you can do to spend just a little time with nature that could help elevate your mood and then create, connect you with a creative, or creative activity that really matters to you that unfortunately we're not all able to pursue in the way that we're used to. So just a little bit of connection with nature uh, through this kind of activity could really help, um, could help you make, make you feel better and feel like you're connecting to, to your craft. Um, so we encourage you to look for some photos of small scenes over the next couple of days, even if it's just with your iPhone around your house. Um, so with that, we would like to thank you uh, for uh, participating in this webinar and we'd like to share a little bit more information about our next webinar which we are going to be doing on Wednesday April 15th at 4 p.m. Um, our topic for that session which will also be related to small scenes is making the most of any light and weather um, and it will include a section on stop complaining about clear skies <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities to photograph uh, like our workshop in Death Valley this year uh, we had five full days of clear skies, and we had a great enthusiastic group who didn't complain about that a single time, and we found ways to fill every single day. So that next session will focus on how you can make the most of any conditions that you encounter in the field and see opportunities all around, regardless of what's happening with the weather and the light. So with that, we will turn to David, who will facilitate our Q&A. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I guess some questions for me first, um, Marvin and Beth both asked, um, when you bring up the blacks, which way are you moving the black slider? So I'm actually moving it to the right. So I'm actually taking some of the blacks out of the image. So I'm actually making it less contrasty when I do that. Um, but what that do it does is it helps create, um, a more, a lot more dynamic range in the image. So it's a better starting place in my opinion. And then I use the tone curve to bring the darks back down, which is actually affecting more of the mid-tone darks. So you don't get the, those really um, nasty blocked up blacks. So it's just a different way of, of approaching it. And it's something that I really enjoy doing. Um, so next up, we have a question for Sarah. Um, when unable to focus stack, do you ever take a wider shot with plans at a crop in case the edges are softer at say F18? Yeah, Tara, that, I think that's a good idea. Um, that's not something that I did in this particular case, but it, it could have definitely worked. So I was at about 78 millimeters, I think, if I remember correctly. So if I pulled back, if I put on a different lens, say my 24-105 and did something like a 50 millimeter uh, framing, then I could go in and crop off edges that were less sharp um, if the F18 didn't work. I'm pretty diligent about checking my LCD when I'm in the field to make sure that, that my far corners are in focus if I'm using just a single photo or just a single exposure. 
so in this case, I did check to make sure that I would be okay. But I think your this idea is if you're uncertain that something like an F16 or F18 will be enough, that that's a good way to ensure that you might have a good option when focus or a good sharp photo when focus stacking isn't an option. And for those of you asking questions in the chat, could you put them in the Q and A instead? It's kind of hard to keep up with the chat, and then we'll be sure to get to them. Um, a question that came up a lot for Jennifer and myself. Um, a lot of questions about the blowing sand and did we protect our camera and lens from that? You want to take that, Jennifer? Sure. So it seems like a really ridiculous thing to take this expensive camera gear that we all have out into the elements, especially with blowing sand, which is essentially blowing shards of glass, um, for lack of a better description. And we head out readily to the dunes with not a care in the world. Um, I, David, no, we don't protect our equipment in a way we aren't putting bags over our lenses or our bodies. Um, what we've kind of learned throughout the years is that if you stay, as, as you're out hiking on the dunes, if you kind of avoid standing below the peaks of the dunes because the wind is driving the sand right over the tops of the dunes and down. So you really get free exfoliation if you choose to stand lower to the ridge or under a ridge. So we just try and we try to not stand there. Um, you do get sand in your coat pockets, you get sand in your pants pockets. Um, as long as you're not changing lenses out there, you're really not affecting the camera too much. I mean, my Nikons are pretty weather sealed really well. Um, David shoots with Fuji and his are weather sealed pretty well. And honestly, in four or five seasons of shooting out on the windy dunes, we've come home and we haven't had any problems. Um, and another good rule of thumb is don't put your camera bag down on the dunes because like I said, that little channel of wind is just kind of around you, up to your ankles. And if you put your camera bag down, it's gonna get covered in sand. So generally we head out there with our cameras on our tripods. Um, we don't change lenses. We kind of choose our lens before we head out and we don't put our camera bag down. So we continually wear the bag out there. And we really haven't had, I should find some wood to knock on as I say this in front of you all, um, we have not had any problems um, and we aren't using UV filters or anything to block the sand on our lenses because when you get up to tripod height, generally there's no sand blowing in your face. It's like I said, it's about ankle to shin down that you get the blowing sand. David, do you want to add anything? No, I think you covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark has a question for you. Um, do you. Did you consider um, doing your image as black and white? And if so, why did you prefer color? Um, that's a good question. You know that I have not played with that one in black and white. And I think it's just because I fell in love with those really warm tones and kind of the purpley background. As you can see, it's my background right now, just because the trailer wall was quite boring. So I, I switched it. Um, but with those highlights and those areas of dark contrast, this, this probably would make a really nice black and white. And thank you for bringing that up. Maybe I'll go back and reprocess it in black and white. Um, I think there was really no clear thought process behind why I haven't. Um, generally any image where you have those nice highlights and those dramatic areas of contrast, like they scream, you know, process me in black and white. But I just, I, it's probably my, it's not an excuse, but it's probably my backlog of imagery and just, I haven't really had a chance to think about doing it in black and white. So maybe I'll accept your challenge and get working processing that in black and white. Cause now actually, as I stare at my own background, I'm kind of curious that that might actually look pretty cool. So thank you, Mark. All right, um, our friend Beth Young has a question um, about the new texture slider in Lightroom and if we use that at all, particularly on sand dune images. Um, I'll say myself, I use it very sparingly, just a little bit here and there on very specific things with local adjustments, um, things like a tree trunk or something that have a lot of texture and I wanna bring some of that out. That's about the only time I use it. Does anybody else have comments on that? I've been using it on some of my sand abstracts from the coast of California just a little bit because like that clarity slider, it's easy to overdo it and it looks really good, you know, from far away. But when you get up into it, it adds noise. Um, and kind of like David said, yeah, I've used it sparingly on really textured things and it, it has added a nice effect. All right, Sarah. About the texture slider? Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, I've experimented with it, but I, I think clarity, if I'm doing my early processing in Lightroom, I'll sometimes add clarity, but I found that the dehaze and the texture, if you do anything more than a little of a bit of an adjustment, you start getting kind of some, some weird artifacts. So I personally haven't really found a big use for it unless you go crazy with it and then it damages your file. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's been my experience. All right. Um, let's see. Bob Muller said he's never heard of Orton before. Um, I'll just say real quick, it's just this effect that you create in Photoshop by kind of blurring out um, certain parts of the image and it kind of creates this glowing effect. Um, if anybody else wants to add anything to that, we'll kind of start flying through these. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, the, I have an action. So if any of you would like a, an Orton action, you can send me an email using our, uh, the contact form on our website. It essentially, from the action that I use, adds a little bit of a pop and a glow um, and a little saturation. And it's, it's also a, in the TK panel. But I only use the most basic TK <laughs> panel, so I wouldn't. <laughs> I use like version four of the Tony Kuiper Luminosity Mask panel, which is um, a little always interesting when I'm teaching Photoshop. And I use version six and I have refused to upgrade from that because I finally just learned it after like four, three years. And David gives me like crap all the time because he's like, you really need to update this. No, I'm good. I'm comfortable where I'm at. So no shame. So Sarah and I, no shame in that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. West, West Charlatan has a question. Um, what are some questions you ask when studying the work of other photographers from old masters like Elliot Porter to current artists like Guy Talon or Alex Noriega? That's a good question. Who wants to take that? <laughs> I have the controversial answer. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so some of you watched Cole Thompson's presentation that he did for the Nature Photographers Network. I've seen a couple of comments about Cole in the webinar chat um, and Cole is somebody who has this philosophy called photo celibacy where he just doesn't look at other people's photos because he feels like he gets that to imprint it on his own mind and I have found that that's really helpful for finding my own vision and what interests me most so I I don't actually spend a lot of time studying photography uh, I get my inspiration from other places and motivation from other places so well I find people like I love Guy Tal's work and I find his writing inspiring and the life choices that he's made inspiring. I don't actually look to his photography to inspire my own or to, to inspire my own work because I feel like, like doing that clouds my goals. Like if I'll, if I'll see one of his photos and go to the same place, I'll have that imprinted on my mind in a way that I think crowds out my own vision. So I actually don't look at that much photography. I think I'm kind of in the same boat. I, um, without even realizing it, I think I have gone kind of celibate with my looking at other other's photography too. Um, I take my inspiration from like landscape painters and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I don't, I guess I don't do much um, introspection on others photos. I try to kind of push those out instead. I kind of fall somewhere along the happy medium. I do enjoy looking at others photos um i just i try not to let it influence my own opinion um like for instance if we're going to I'm trying to think of a place we've never been um let's say we go to point reyes seashore in california it's definitely on the list to do i probably wouldn't google it and look it up and see other people's photos um because i want to kind of keep my own conscience clear and kind of see what i can create um, but I do, that being said, I mean, I, I do enjoy, you know, social media and looking at other people's photos and what they've done. I like interacting with people, um, organically. I don't let what others have done influence me. So like, you know, if someone's got an amazing image of these mud cracks, you know, I'm not sitting there comparing it to my own work. That was probably the biggest lesson I've learned throughout my photography journey is just learning to not compare my work to others, but just challenge myself and always be my own competitor to better myself and just enjoy it. You know, it's, it's not a competition. Um, but to kind of get back to the meat of your question, um, when I look at some of the old 
you know, the masters of the landscape photography world and nature photography. Um, I, I like trying to figure out the story. I like trying to figure out what kind of an emotion they were trying to emote. Um, like, for example, one of my favorite books to look at is The Place No One Knew about the Glen Canyon recreation, that whole, the flooding of the canyon. Um, a lot of those images in there really tell a story of a place. And I think when I look at other imagery from, you know, Guy, Elliot, you know, all the, I won't name them all, but, um, you know, I like to look at their imagery and just to see if I can get that sense of feeling that they had or kind of having more of an understanding of what they were feeling or the point that they were trying to convey with the photo. Um, I think it goes a lot with my own photography. I, I strive to tell stories and I enjoy listening to other people's stories with their own photography. So I think I'm always just trying to view their images and see what were they trying to share. All right. Um, a question from our friend Doug Beasley. Um, uh -oh. He says, I don't believe white balance was addressed in the presented photos. He's curious about which white balance was used on each of the presented images. Um, I will say, um, first off, that um, giving a specific white balance to you will not be helpful at all because it's going to vary on all different conditions. So we typically shoot in auto when we're out in the field and then um, in raw, um, we'll adjust things to find that perfect white balance. And I have kind of a weird method that I've come up with increasing the saturation so you can see the colors more clearly. And I cover that in my video too. Um, but really it's a personal preference um, and finding something, I know Sarah goes a lot cooler with her images and I go kind of somewhere in the middle where it's kind of cool, but then I kind of bring out the warmer um, tones and the light areas. So add anything to that ladies? Um, I'm like David, I keep my white balance mostly on auto. Um, occasionally when I'm in the field and I'm visualizing an image, I might change it on my camera just to kind of see the effect that it gives to kind of give myself a little heads up. So when I'm processing it, um, which I know, I mean, the argument there is you can just go into the Lightroom and just do it yourself. But sometimes in the visual or sometimes in the field, I, I do like to see that in real time. An example of that is slot canyons. If you shoot slot canyons with the fluorescent setting on your camera, it actually produces some really nice color um, depending on the situation. So yeah, there are a few times that I play with white balance in the field, but for the most part, I am shooting an auto and not worrying about it too much. And in fact, that my, I can tell you my image was shot with daylight, I believe, which is my auto. I also use auto white balance on my camera. And um, as David mentioned, and as I think I said during my uh, talk about my photo, I always cool things off. 99 times out of 100, I cool things off. And it's just personal preferences around colors. Like my house is cool tones. I prefer cool tones when I'm choosing clothing. Uh, so when I'm working on my photography, I just prefer cooler tones. So I sh photograph in the field and auto white balance and then almost always cool off the colors in my photo, in all of my photos. All right, uh, I've got a question from Alan Krager. Mm -hmm. um, do you, any of you or all of you prefer c composing in live view or do you use the view viewfinder, why? I'm obsessed with live view, but I also <laughs> use the viewfinder. Like, since I photograph with my husband all the time and he is not a live view user, we can compare battery usage. And I go through batteries almost twice as fast as he does because he never uses his live view. Uh, so I think it's really helpful to compose using live view and then I fine tune using the viewfinder. So that's my particular habit because I think both of those tools are particularly useful. Um, and with newer mirrorless cameras in the viewfinder, you can often zoom in and see details. So it's like having a little dark loop right in the field. So you can really look at sharpness and other details really easily with that feature on a mirrorless camera. So I say both. Yeah, I, I'm like Sarah, I would say maybe 60, 40, 60% um, being live view for me and 40 being the viewfinder. Um, I find the viewfinder very useful, especially in my grand scenics. If I'm standing on a vista or overlooking something um, very grand, I will use my viewfinder. I will put my camera up to my face and look through the viewfinder and just kind of scan. And I find that I, I like to see a lot of my smaller scenes that way. And it actually kind of helps me focus in and hone in on those scenes 
and I'll see things doing it that way versus in live view if I've just got my screen up and I'm looking that I may not catch. Um, I do like using my live view for focus stacking, you know, making thing, making sure things are in focus. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say that's probably 60, 40 live versus viewfinder is about where I fall. I would say I actually use live view about 80% of the time, which might be because I'm so tall um, and I don't want to be bending over. It hurts my back. So I think that might be why I do that. <laughs> and it's just more enjoyable for me because of that. So um, I, like Sarah said, I use mirrorless as well. So I like using the viewfinder to see things when it's really bright out, but otherwise I'm using live view most of the time. All right. Um, Uh, duh, 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 sorry. A lot of questions here. Um, <laughs> That's good. Sorry, I was busy answering the question instead of looking. <laughs> well, we could do the one that's, uh, what is your favorite lens and why? Mm. I can answer really quickly. My 100, yep. 400, absolutely. I wish I had a like 100, 800 because I love zooming in on things. So uh, I really feel like that's such a versatile lens because 100 and 400 gives such a different perspective, but having it in a single package on my camera at, uh, often just makes it easy to try out a lot of different things in, this, in a landscape. So definitely my long telephoto. Mine would be the 28 to 300. So what I photographed that photo I shared tonight with, um, that probably stays on my camera 80% of the time. Um, I don't take it off. It's got such a nice range from the 28 to the 300 that I have the freedom to move in between all of those focal lengths freely um, without worrying about changing lenses or bringing lenses with me. Um, but yeah, I've I would say about 60 to 70% of my photography the last four years has been done with that lens. And it's, I mean, it's an older one from Nikon. They haven't updated it recently, but I still love it. It's sharp. It's a little soft around when you're wide open at 300, but it's rarely noticeable, at least for my copy. Um, but yeah, just that freedom to not have to worry about changing lenses and getting stuck in gear. Um, but yeah, the 28 to 300 for me. And for me, it's probably a mix between like a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 300 equivalent. Um, yeah, those are the ones I use the most and hardly ever have the wide angle on anymore. So that's my short answer. Um, <laughs> um, Robert asks if we use Helicon for focus stacking and quick answer is yes, we all do. Yes. We Somebody it. also asked what focus stacking is. Um, yeah, so focus stacking is just um, taking multiple shots at different focus points and then um, using those in in post-processing to bring them all together, which we use Helicon Focus so that uh, the entire image is in focus. Uh, let's see. Uh, Cynthia asks, do you, uh, do you scout locations first or find them as you go for small scenes? I'll let Sarah take that one. She has a good answer. <laughs> Um, I don't plan anything whatsoever. Um, I always go with the most open mind that I can have and then see what a landscape is presenting me. The only time I plan photos is when I've been to a place and I want to return under different conditions. And then I plan, like I have that intention of photographing that particular thing. Uh, but I find that I'm a lot happier when I open my mind to see what I see. So I don't, when I'm going out to sand dunes, I don't say I want, ripples in the foreground and then a prominent dune in the background and then pretty clouds radiate radiating out from there I say I have no idea what I'll see I might see a plant that I really like I might see mud cracks that I think I want to stop and photograph or I might see the telephoto dune shots um, and it's really what my connection is that day what my mood is like and what nature is giving me and then I respond to those things instead of having any preconceived ideas about what my plan is going to be and I'm pretty much the same anymore. Yeah, we're all pretty much on the same page with that one. It's very rare where I've got a planned shoot nowadays, unless it's something for night photography or a location that I visited. 
a few days prior that now I want to photograph in some different light, but most of the time it's literally just going out hiking and exploring and seeing what nature brings to me. All right. Um, Jimmy Arcade has an interesting question. Um, how would you recommend finding your local tribe of photographers to go out and shoot together? Um, he said he started checking out MPN, um, but yeah, he wants to hang out with cool people like us. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. It is hard. And especially given the state of circumstances right now, it's, it's not like you can go to things and meet people. Um, yeah. Sometimes camera clubs are a good source. Again, those aren't running right now, I'm sure, but um, NPN is a great place. Um, I don't know where you're located. But... NPN. We have to mention that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> David and I brought the NPN brought us together. Yeah, that's yeah, true. That's yeah. how we met yeah. originally. Yeah, like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's actually a section on NPN that I put on there. Um, that's for helping people find other photographers. So if you put a post in there, you can, um, help, you know, help you find people in your area and maybe you can go out and shoot together. And we occasionally have some meetups where people all go out together. And so that's a cool way to connect people. Um, also photo conferences. I've mm -hmm. been, I had totally dismissed photography conferences until recently when I was asked to speak at a couple of them. And then I've turned into a total evangelist because they are so much fun and it's a great way to meet like-minded people and you're spending enough time with them in a condensed over a condensed few couple of days that it's, I think it's easier to make bonds than just seeing somebody once a month at a one hour or two hour photo club meeting. So I actually think photography conferences and the, the fact that there are so many more, that's another great way to make connections with people who really enjoy doing the same thing that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, a few more questions here about running out of time. Um, Psychit, I don't, I don't, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but um, has it ever happened that you had a certain vision of the final image when you shot in the field, but during processing, you expressed it in a different way, maybe because you were looking at the image with a different mentality now? Um, if so, do you think the differences in your vision, the field, and during processing, if any, it dissolves away over time as you learn and grow as a photographer? Mm, anybody want to take that? <laughs> I could answer this from my perspective around uh, my black and white photography, which I started doing purely by going back in my Lightroom catalog and looking at photos in a different way. So I had never intended when I started out to have an interest in black and white photography, but now that's one of my main focus areas. So I think just over time, I've been drawn more to that and thus have returned to photos that I intended to be presented in color and now they're in my black and white portfolio only. So, um, and I also found that I use a lot less saturation and a lot less contrast now. So the way that I pre pre present my photos in general has changed a lot. And I think it's just, in some ways, it's getting more comfortable with who I am as a photographer, that I just like subtlety and I like grace and elegance. So trying to do big, bold, colorful images just doesn't work that well for me. So in some ways, it was just becoming more comfortable with who I am as a photographer and then being able to express that in my, in how I present my images. And I'll say sometimes um, when I'm out in the field, I'm just collecting information, um, just getting good compositions, good light. And then sometimes when I get back, I'll play with it in Lightroom and just try um, making it really dark and moody or um, going with something that's really high key and really soft and airy and just see what works the best. So I like to play around with things and see how it works out. So yeah, it does, it can change from the field to processing. So I, I just like to play around with it. And definitely um, as I've grown, things have changed dramatically. So um, it does pay off to go back to your old images and process them in a different way. And I'll save time that, and just say that I'm pretty much like David. Um, it kind of depends on the mood I'm in when I'm processing and sometimes my vision has changed for that image. Like maybe I do want to make this a little more moody or maybe I do want to do this in black and white or high key. Um, so yeah, it just all depends on the day, but yeah, I mean, I, I still have those images where I shoot them. I have my vision and I say, this is what I'm doing with my vision, but you know, a little, you know, switching it up a little bit and changing my mind does happen occasionally. All right, and someone asked, what does NPN stand for? Sorry, that's the Nature Photographers Network. 
So if you go to uh, naturephotographers.network, that's a community of photographers and you can get image critiques and all, all sorts of fun stuff there. Um, Robert at social media. David, do you think yeah. we should do like lightning round style where just one of us answers? Oh, we could do I that. I can't even um, see the questions because I, do, unless I get off the slides, so that's why I haven't been like looking at them because I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we can blow through them and um, get some of these done. Um, Robert asked which conferences um, you're talking about. Um, there's one called the Outsiders that just started up. Um, there's also out of um, Chicago. It's also like out of Moab, out of Acadia, all these different things. Um, Am I missing any? There are some regional events, like there's a big Northeast Camera Club conference, I think, in North in the Northeast. There's a Smoky Mountains gathering. Uh, there's a big camera club somewhere in Oregon that has an annual conference. So those would be a couple of examples. Okay. Um, do you always expose to the right? Um, do you get any banding at low contrast scenes? Um, I'll say that I expose to the right most of the time, just a little bit. I don't go crazy with it, um, but that just gives you a little more detail in your final images and then I darken it up and post. Um, do you prefer matrix center or weight or spot metering in which circumstances? Um, I personally do like matrix, so it's a whole scene all the time. I don't know what anybody else does on that. I do. I don't think I've moved off matrix in probably two or three years. Yeah. Can I be honest and say I have no idea what metering mode my camera is set to, <laughs> <laughs> to be? Yeah, I really don't. Okay. I rely, rely more upon the histogram myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I agree that the histogram is a much more reliable indicator of what's happening in your scene. Yeah. All right. Um, and someone, uh, Joe asked about the, uh, about my, method of bringing the blacks up is there he says is there any clip blacks in the image um typically not no with that method i don't get many clip blacks unless i really push it far uh, maybe in black and white i will but not in color um scott asks if um using long lenses um when pointing or not that's a different one sorry um, <laughs> um in combination with depth of field what's the reason for this successful combination um I don't know, I think just uh, being able to shoot kind of parallel with the subject helps get everything in focus. Um, not sure if that's what you're looking for there. Um, do you typically shoot in manual mode? Um, personally, I shoot a mix of manual and um, aperture priority. Um, I'd say aperture priority most of the time, unless I'm really trying to get control of the shutter speed. Anybody else? Manual. Um, manual all manual. the time. Okay. I do aperture priority when I'm photographing hand with uh, flowers and plants with my camera hand or with hand holding. Okay. And I will use shutter priority. The only time I deviate from manual is when I'm shooting the dolphins. Then I'm on shutter priority. Um, Chris asked, what is a great way to sell intimate nature photos like yours? Uh, <laughs> I don't think any of us have a good answer for that because we no. don't really sell much of them. We do uh, not sell. Prints, prints, prints. Like people like this kind of stuff hanging on their wall. Um, and I, th I think there's, there's still a community for people that like this kind of work, for yeah. sure. I uh, would say getting it in a gallery or opening in a gallery yourself would be yeah. <laughs> one of the main ways to do it. Or, and to be truthful, David and I haven't focused on prints or print sales in four years. We've been doing this together, so. Yeah, you would, have, you would have to focus your life on selling prints to make yeah. it successful run at it. Yeah. Um, Sarah, how did you get your tripod over the pond? Oh, I was fixing my webcam again. Um, <laughs> so I ordered a webcam and shockingly it didn't get here in time. So I'm switching between my phone and my integrated webcam. So sorry for the crappy video. Um, so whenever I want to be, is when I'm photographing something that in, includes water, Sometimes if I'm, if I have my waders, I'll get into the water. In this particular situation, I didn't want to get anywhere near the water because the whole point was not disturbing the leaves. So in this case, I put my two front legs out as far as possible and then leaned the tripod and the camera forward so I could face it down as much as possible 
uh, well, essentially just holding on to the tripod so that it wouldn't fall into the pond. So uh, essentially just extending the legs as far as possible and then pushing it out over the pond would be my general strategy for this kind of situation. Being really careful not to move it because then you get ripples, which then cause problems with sharpness and disturb the thing that you're trying to photograph. And Rita asked about my colors and tones video. I will send out a link to that afterwards with a discount code. And Sarah will have a discount on her ebook about small scenes too. Um, it's about the same question. Um, Rob asked, do we worry about diffraction when we're shooting over F16? Um, sometimes it's consideration, um, but I would say like with macro lenses, it's much less of a consideration because they are sharp at those smaller apertures. Um, but yeah, it's something to think about and we focus stack to avoid that when needed. And getting to know your lenses so you know how far you can push them. Yeah. Because in the case of my macro lens, I can push it really far. Like I can go to F25 or even further um, versus my 24 to 105 doesn't have that same flexibility. So it's just getting to know your lens really well so that you can make a good decision based on the circumstance that you're photographing in. And a good way to do that is just literally go out in your backyard and just take test shots at every aperture so you kind of get to know your range and where it starts getting diffracted. All right, um, well, I think we're out of time here. Um, we still have a lot of questions, but um, we're gonna have to stop it now. So if you guys want to ask us questions, I will send you a link to um, our Exploring Exposure forum where you can ask questions there. And you can sign up for that for free and we'll try to get back to you on that. And so, always feel free to email us questions too. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're, we really wanna get to everyone's questions, but just drop us a line. We're always happy to talk to you guys. Yeah, and be sure to sign up for our next webinar, which is coming up soon. Um, can you bring that link up again, just so people see it one more time? Yeah. All right, and with thank that. Thank you guys for joining us. This was our first foray into webinars. So thank you for your patience, but it looks like everything went really well. So yay for technology. Yeah. Yes, Not thank bad you for everybody. first time. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> Hopefully we'll see you on the 15th. Yes. Yeah. All right, everyone stay safe and take care. All right, bye, bye guys. <laughs>